Good evening, everyone. It's great to see y'all again. Oh, by the way, I'm Alexa, the local emo girly who likes to pop in every once in a while. Today's video is one that had me fuming because as a woman, women's rights or lack thereof throughout history is always pretty darn infuriating to read. The amount of oppression that still has roots in our society to this day is sickening. But I promise I'm not gonna fly off the handle just yet. Here are the top 10 messed up things women went through in the Victorian era. In 10th place, we have loss of rights under marriage. Under English common law, a married woman lost her legal independence she could not enter contracts or sue, and her property and obligations were mostly subsumed by those of her husband, the couple becoming a single legal entity. In less legalese, any property she might have had in her name, be it through family holdings or being, you know, signed over, became her husband's and not hers the moment she signed her marriage license. Mm. Also, any personal property acquired by the wife during the marriage effectively came under the full control of her husband. A married woman was unable to dispose of any property without her husband's consent, and upon divorce, women generally had no rights to any property accumulated during marriage, usually leaving them uh, impoverished. Women were able to retain some property they possessed prior to marriage in certain cases during a divorce. Certain cases. So if your dad gifted you, say, a summer home for safety, and you wanted to divorce your husband and take back that uh, rightfully given home for your new home, yeah, uh, good luck getting that back. Besides the dowries, prenuptial agreements effectively allowed married women to maintain beneficial interest in her previously owned or inherited real property, which was placed under trusteeship, allowing her to have a separate income from her husband. Moral of this story, Sign the damn prenup. In ninth place, we have a uh, lack of consent in marriage. So in addition to losing your rights over whatever property you brought into the arrangement, if you are a girl like me, consent and rights over your own body um, didn't exist. Marriage overrode a woman's right to consent to sexual intercourse with her husband, giving him effective ownership over her body. Honestly, just add it to the dowry list. Insert man's name here uh, is to be gifted however many gold coins, a couple of cows, the right to my land, all in the rights to do what he pleases with my body. Am I ever we're glad I live in today's day and age. I have the right to look at that and say, uh, absolutely not. Women were expected to have sex with only one man, her husband. Just imagine a husband for me here, okay? On the flip side, it was acceptable for men to have multiple partners in their life. Some husbands had lengthy affairs with other women while their wives stayed with their husbands because uh, divorce wasn't always an option. But if a woman had sexual contact with another man, she was seen as ruined or fallen and considered to have violated the marriage. Yeah, gotta love a double standard. Victorian literature and art was full of examples of women paying dearly for straying from moral expectations. Adulteresses met tragic Tragicans in novels, including the ones by you know great writers such as Tolstoy, Flaubert, or Thomas Hardy, as opposed to the modern possibility of happiness and fulfillment from adultery. While some writers and artists showed sympathy towards women's subjugation to this double standard, some works were uh, didactic and uh, reinforced the cultural norm. In the Victorian era, sex was not discussed openly and honestly. Public discussions of sexual encounters and matters were met with uh, feigned ignorance, embarrassment, and fear. One public opinion of women's sexual desires was that they were not very troubled by sexual urges. Even if women's desires were lurking, sexual experiences came with consequences for women and families. Limiting family sizes resulted in resisting sexual desires, except when a husband had desires which, as a wife, women were contracted to fulfill. To discourage premarital sexual relations, the new poor law provided that women bear financial responsibilities for out-of-wedlock pregnancies. In 1834, women were made legally and financially supportive of their illegitimate children. Sexual relations for women could not just be about desire and feelings. This was a luxury reserved for men. The consequences of sexual interaction actions for women took away the physical desires that woman could possess. In eighth place, we have purity culture. The ideal Victorian woman was pure, refined, and modest. Makes me gag to say it, but here goes nothing. This ideal was supported by etiquette and manners. The etiquette extended to the pretension of never acknowledging the use of undergarments, which would be referred to as unmentionables. The discussion of such a topic, it was feared, would gravitate towards unhealthy attention on anatomical details. As one Victorian lady expressed it, these are not things, my dear, that we speak of. Indeed, we try not even to think of them, in contrast to the modern norms of frank and constant discussion of, you know, details. 
Part of me while I'm rolling my eyes here. The pretense of avoiding acknowledgement of anatomical realities met with the uh, embarrassing failure on occasion. For example, in 1859, the Honorable Eleanor Stanley wrote about an incident where the Duchess of Manchester moved too quickly while maneuvering over a stile. Tripping over her large hoop skirt, she went head over heels, landing on her feet with her cage and her whole petticoats above her head. They say there was never such a thing seen, and the other ladies hardly knew whether to be thankful or not that a part of her undergarments consisted in a pair of scarlet tartan knickerbockers, which were revealed to the view of all all the world in general, and to the Duke de Malakoff in particular. What a scandal. However, despite the fact that Victorians considered the mention of women's undergarments in mixed company unacceptable, men's entertainment made great comedic material out of the topic of ladies' bloomers, including men's magazines and music hall skits. Ah, there's that icky double standard again. In seventh place, we have denial of education. Women were generally expected to marry and perform household and motherly duties, rather than seek uh, formal education. Even women who were not successful in finding husbands were generally expected to remain without university degrees and to take a position as a governess or as a supporter to other members of the family. The outlook for education-seeking women improved when Queen's College in Harley Street, London, was founded in 1848. The goal of this college was to um, provide governesses with a marketable education because, you know, gotta have a governess. Later, the Cheltenham Ladies College and other girls' public schools were founded, increasing educational opportunities for women's education and leading eventually to the development of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies in 1887. I'm Great at entertaining the spawn of others, but I promise you all that I'm not someone you want as a mom or a teacher. Nah. -uh. In sixth place, we have lower pay. Women cannot be expected to be paid the same wage as a man for the same work, despite the fact that women were as likely as men to be you know, married and supporting children. In 1906, the government found that the average weekly factory wage for a woman ranged from 11 cents over three days to 18 cents over eight days, whereas a man's average weekly wage was around 25 cents for nine days. Women were also preferred by many factory owners because they could be more easily induced to undergo severe bodily fatigue than men. Childminding was another necessary expense for many women working in factories. Pregnant women worked up until the day they gave birth and returned to work as soon as they were physically able. In 1891, a law was passed requiring women to take four weeks away from the factory work after giving birth, but many women could not afford this unpaid leave and the law remained unenforced. This point as a whole is still, sadly, a reality in our modern day. Many women don't make the same as men for the same jobs and are expected to do more for less. In fifth place, we have job inequality. Come on, it's not enough to pay women less. We gotta give them the crappier jobs as well. The lowest paying jobs available to working class London women were matchbox making and sorting rags in a rag factory where flea and lice ridden rags were to be sorted to be pulped for manufacturing paper. Needlework was the single largest paid occupation for women working from home, but the work paid little and women often had to rent sewing machines if they cannot purchase them. So where's that money going? These home manufacturing industries became known as sweated industries. The select committee of the House of Commons defined sweated industries in 1890 as work carried on for inadequate wages and for excessive hours in unsanitary conditions. Wow, I'm shocked. By 1906, such workers earned about a penny an hour. In fourth place, we have limitations on hobbies. Yep because controlling a woman's body, work, and forcing her to run a household and reproduce wasn't enough. Nah. Women's physical activity was a cause of concern at the highest levels of academic research during this time. Sadly, uh, here in Canada, physicians debated the appropriateness of women using bicycles. Remember that purity culture I mentioned a moment ago? Yeah, here we go again. A series of letters published in the Dominion Medical Monthly and Ontario Medical Journal in 1896 expressed concern that women seated on a bicycle seat could have uh, an organ Oh no. Fearful of unleashing and creating a nation of oversexed females, some physicians urged colleagues to encourage women to give up modern dangers and continue to pursue traditional leisure pursuits. Seriously. However, not all medical colleagues were convinced of the link between cycling and and this debate on women's leisure activities continued well into the 20th century. In the early part of the 19th century, it was believed that physical activity was dangerous and inappropriate for women. Girls were taught to reserve their delicate health for the express purpose of birthing healthy children, and one of these considered benefits of the corset was to restrict respiration. Don't worry, I'll get back to corset Helen myths in just a moment. Furthermore, the physiological differences between the sexes helped to reinforce the societal inequality. An anonymous female writer was able to contend that women were not intended to fill male roles because women are, as a rule, physically smaller and weaker than men, their brain is much lighter, and they are in every way unfitted for the same amount of bodily or mental labor that men are able to undertake. Well, pardon me and my tiny brain. 
Can I be excused and paid to go sit on a fainting couch? In third place, we have corset trends. I'm going to start this by making sure everyone knows that I'm emphasizing the harmful trends, not dismissing corsets as a whole. I'm personally a huge fan of corsets and various historical shapewear, since when worn properly, they're actually quite comfortable and beneficial to one's health and posture. Improperly worn corsets, or ones worn too tight, can cause a variety of problems. And my displaced ribs are a sad example of that. Anyhow, allow me to continue before I sidetrack myself to infinity and beyond. Victorian women's clothing followed trends that emphasized elaborate dresses. Skirts with wide volume created by the use of layered materials such as crinolines, hoop skirt frames, and heavy fabrics. The ideal silhouette of the time demanded a narrow waist, which was accomplished by constricting the abdomen with a tightly laced corset. While the silhouette was striking, and the dresses themselves were often exquisitely detailed creations, the fashions weren't ideal. At best, they restricted women's movements, and at worst, they had a harmful effect on women's health. Physicians turned their attention to the use of corsets and uh, determined that they caused several medical problems. Compression of the thorax, restricted breathing, organ displacement, poor circulation, and a uh, prolapsed uterus. Oh no, can't harm that baby making factory. Articles advocating the reform of women's clothing by the British National Health Society, the Ladies Dress Association, and the Rational Dress Society were reprinted in the Canada Lancet, Canada's medical journal. Nowadays, corsets are a choice, not a necessity, and I often prefer them over the more popular underwire bra. In second place, we have Magdalene Asylums. So Magdalene, As so Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were initially protestant, but later mostly Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house uh, fallen women. The institutions were named after the biblical figure Mary Magdalene, who in you know, earlier centuries characterized as a reformed lady of the night. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in undesirable fields, young women who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young women who just didn't have familial support. They were required to work without pay. Apart from meager food provisions, well, the institutions operated large commercial laundries, serving customers outside of their bases. Many of these laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes of the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. This contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women, as opposed to uh, punishing them. The last one known closed only in 1996, which is a year before I was born, so they went on for way too long. In our first place, we have Woman of the Night. During the Victorian age, women selling their bodies was a wide-scale problem in Britain. The very essence of it went against every moral value that was promoted during this time. Values such as, you know, chastity, prudence, and grace were dismissed and disregarded by fallen women. These women were led into this line of work for varying reasons, the most prominent being, you know, social and economic concerns. Upon entering into this world, there were several different avenues that could be taken by women, including military encampments, brothels, and, um, street walking. The number of women participating in this trade during the Victorian age was uh, staggeringly high. Although London police reports recorded that you know there were approximately 8,600 women of the night known to them, it has been suggested that the true number during this time was closer to 80,000. As a result, concerns were raised and the prominence led to several government acts. Goodness forbid a woman try and make money for herself on her own terms through selling something that would already be part of a dowry. This act would allow women to barter within the marketplace without influence of men who would often take their earnings and goods. And that brings us to the end of our list and I'm sure you can see the smoke pouring out of my ears. Oh gosh, what a scandal. I've been talking about women's undergarments, sexuality, and been paid to do so. I'm definitely a modern gal, and a queer one who is very happy to be living in the time I'm currently in. Sure, things are far from perfect, but I have rights over my body, and marriage is a choice, not a living. Let me know in the comments if there's anything more messed up I forgot to mention today. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and I'll see you all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.